Good evening, everyone. My name is Maggie, and on behalf of Book Soup, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for our virtual event this evening with Joe Piazza and Christine Pride in conversation with Tiki Koroshetz discussing We Are Not Like Them. We're so excited and grateful that our bookstore can continue to bring authors and their works to our community during this time. We'll be hosting more and more virtual events in the near future, and you can learn about them on our website, booksoup.com, as well as our social media at Booksoup. Our next event is Monday, October 18th, um, so this coming Monday, with Anna David in conversation with Jeff Garland discussing Party Girl. Support our bookstore and our authors and purchase a copy of tonight's featured book. Just click on the green purchase button that reads We Are Not Like Them directly below the viewer screen. The link will redirect you to our website where you can continue your checkout process. We're selling digital audiobooks and eBooks through Libro FM and Kobo for those who are interested. Um, if you'd like to ask a question during the event, please uh, click the ask a question box at the bottom of the screen and type it in. Please do not use the sidebar chat to ask a question. Um, so a little more about our presenters. Christine is a writer, editor, and longtime publishing veteran. She's held editorial posts at many different trade imprints, including Doubleday, Broadway, Crown, Hyperion, and Simon & Schuster. As an editor, Christine has published a range of books with a special emphasis on inspirational stories and memoirs, uh, including numerous New York Times bestsellers. As a freelance editorial consultant, she does select editing and proposal content development, as well as teaching and coaching, and pens a regular column, Race Matters, for Cup of Joe. Joe Piazza is an award-winning journalist, editor, and podcast host. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, CNN, Marie Claire, Glamour, and other notable publications. She's also the author of Charlotte Walsh Likes to Win, How to Be Married, The Knockoff, Fitness Junkie, and If Nuns Ruled the World. <laughs> um, and they will be in conversation with Kiki, who is the wellness director at Goop. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to turn the camera over to Joe and Christine and Kiki. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I think the most important part in my bio, which was missing, was that I was, Christine was one of my first bosses. So I was your assistant in 2011. How long ago? Um, 2010 or 11. And I was thinking about it today, like not to make this all wacky nostalgic, but that really was like when I look back at that time, like the happiest time in my life. And it was so funny because I just felt like it was like, you know, just the small things. It was like going to, I was like going to Starbucks. It was like, this is so cool. Like I'm, I'm a city girl. I'm working with yeah. the most fun bosses. And I think like everyone around me would like look around and be like, how are you? Like, like, are you like seeing, are you like, are you just so, but it was our company yeah. was not the greatest, in the greatest state. Well, um, I interviewed about 22 people for your job uh, and enthusiastically hands down hire you you're so by far the best candidate and I always said one day I'm going to end up answering to Kiki and mm -hmm. here we are I here literally are. Here's an adorable picture of this love for us by the way <laughs> oh my gosh um but no I was thinking about that like it's interesting that you guys, and I always mix up epigraph and epitaph, which I'm going to try not to do, but I think it's interesting that you started your epigraph with the, with these two quotes about friendship and knowing people for a long time. And I was thinking about that throughout the book. It was really something that I think was unique to this story, this question of like, how important is it? How important are old friends? What is the value of an old friend? And then what is the value of people who come into our lives at different moments? Um, you know, just thinking of Riley and Jen versus Riley and her friend Gabby. Um, and there was something I remember that Gwen had said to me at one point, and I think it might have been something her parents said to her, was like, you can never make old friends again. Um, and that really stuck with me. It's so simple, but it, it's true. It's like we have these people that know us at specific points in our lives and know certain pieces of us. Um, but I think sometimes we do struggle with like knowing like, okay, how important is that? And how important, and when is it a moment when we, we step away, this person no longer knows us, is going to know this side of us. So how did you guys decide that it was going to be a friendship that was a childhood friendship? And, and did you always know, did you kind of know how the arc of their friendship would play out? Or did you debate with whether they would have different types of fallouts, if they would come back together, if 
there would be a hard no at some point? And how'd you kind of think about that? Yeah, I'll jump in. I mean, I think I love opening the conversation this way because it really centers the friendship uh, in the story. And that it that was our whole goal the whole time to really bring alive this friendship because Joe and I love our friends. That's why the epigraphs are there. They're both about friendship to really set the tone for the book. And we wanted to write a book about friendship because there are so many books about romantic love and rom-coms and the happy endings. And, you know, they're all so heterosexual even. It's just like, you know, these are the stories we hear over and over again. Um, and Lestal, I think, is the story of friendships and particularly lifelong friendships and in a positive way, right? Like these are two friends who met when they were so young. And I think you nailed it, Kiki, and describing it as that somebody is a witness to your life and that sees all the versions of yourself. And you change so much, obviously, between five and 35 and you go through all these formative milestones and to have somebody be there for that is just going to be a completely different kind of relationship than if you meet somebody at 25 and even if you're friends for 40 years from there Mm -hmm. it's just different and so we really were intentional about having Riley meet Riley and Jen meet when they're so young so that they have this this really unique bond but also they had to meet when they were so young because they, the way we wanted to structure the book where they have things to confront as adults, lots of different things to confront, but one of them is race. And that is because they weren't having these conversations as children at 5, 10, 15. And so that all played into that decision making too. It's really only, it's one of the only times in your life when you don't have to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Like it's one of the only times you can actually say, yes, I am colorblind because I am a child. Uh, but I think an interesting like hallmark of how close Christine and I are still both to our like old fr- longtime friends is we had our book launch in New York uh, last week, and both of us had like such old friends there. Like yeah. I had one of my oldest friends from elementary school, and then my first friend that I made in college, and they also all like trained in or flew in mm-hmm. and same for Christine and just because they were excited to support us even in in the middle of a pandemic. These women mean so much to us and we just don't celebrate it enough. Can we uh, cheers to that? And I'm using that as an excuse to, I don't want to sip my wine until we acknowledge that everybody has has wine. But it's Friday after five, wherever anybody is right now. It's, it's real Friday late for us. It's, I mean, this is bedtime for me. It really is. <laughs> um, yeah, one of the, I mean, there were so many moments of their friendship that I related to. And there was this one moment that really stood out to me when I think, um, our, I think it's Riley who says something like, she had to say something out loud in order to know what she felt about it to like see mm-hmm. Jen's reaction on her face. And I okay. have those friends too, where it's like, definitely, you've been chewing on something, like there's been something like, it's like in a your gut or, and you don't even necessarily know what it is yet. And mm-hmm. you say it and it's like the way your friend reacts to you and you react to everything friends. you need to know about that situation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it like crystallizes something and I thought, I love that. And then there's the moment I thought the first chapter was so brilliantly done in the way of setting up who they both are. And I think it's um, Riley walks in and it's Jen whose hair is cut short. Right. Mm -hmm. And she says something like she's like editing the scene to be a more familiar sight. And I really related to that, too, because it's like I think another part of this book was the both of them watching each other change and wondering Mm -hmm. what that meant for them. And it's like you have those moments where like you do go in and you're like editing a scene, you know, it's like someone's like new boyfriend or they look different or they're acting different. And you're kind of like doing all these mental jumping jacks in order to like place things the way that like, you know, this person. Yeah, the comfort. Yeah. Well, I think that's so interesting about old friendships. And this is something that they do struggle with is this idea of you want everything to kind of be preserved in this amber bubble of this is how it was. And yet at the same time, you have to bristle against the idea of no one can stay the same. Like they're going to, you know, one's married, one's not. One's having a baby, one's not. One has a different career, one day, you know. I mean, these are real material differences in their adult lives. And yet that's the push and pull, right? Like we want it to be exactly like it was in eighth grade. 
And yet, you know, you have to either evolve your friendship or allow room for both of you to be different. And that is what we see them in the process of doing almost like allowing both of them each allowing each other to be to be different and figuring out what that means for their equilibrium. But also in some ways you never do. So like when mm -hmm. I then see my friends that I made when I was 18, we'll have one glass of wine and then like fall back into the <laughs> yeah. Remember this, which is my favorite game ever, which of course mm -hmm. ends up in the book. Um, so I think, but I think there's something beautiful about that too, because it's a, almost a time machine. Like just yes. seeing this person from a certain stage of your life, you get to then turn back into that person, even just for a few minutes. And that's sometimes really comforting. I have a funny related story that might be fueled by the wine, but Joe and I have been putting a lot on Instagram. And so I was asking Julie, who's a friend I met in first grade, you know, what like kind of old photos we had. And she dug up this collage that we made in eighth grade with all of our middle school memories, which is, you have it. You show it. Which I wanted to put on Instagram, but there's in the bottom left-hand corner, there is really an ode to my breathless, passionate, completely unrequited childhood crushes. <laughs> and I was like, if this person who shall remain nameless sees this on Instagram, even all these years later, I'm going to be mortified. I feel like they'd be so flattered. If I saw something like that, that I would be so flattered. flattered. I think you, you should show it right now. Just <laughs> <one of them. laughs> no. I feel like she's she flattered like, no. really entertaining. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, um, and I think something else too that, and this was, I didn't know that quote, the quote from Trouble that you guys had for mm -hmm. Uppercraft, but this question of how much should you challenge a friend and how how much is it like on you to to improve your friend so-called to make them better, to help evolve their mindsets, to push them. And how much is it, you know, that person's, especially in the case of Riley and Jen, because there was this privilege mismatch where like, was it really Riley's, like, was it her place or her responsibility to move Jen in this way because they were so close? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, how did you guys think about that and what Riley would, would want to do? That's a really good question, Kiki. And all of the thinking about this book and writing it even, and tell me, Joe, if you had already given this thought, but I really never thought about Riley's obligation or responsibility or you know mm -hmm. even if she felt an internal burden to bring Jen along you know what I mean and I, I wonder no. if that's more because it is like accepting your friend for who she is right we all have mm -hmm. friends that are more ambitious or less ambitious and I think it's not mm -hmm. about remaking your friend necessarily in the version that you want for them right it's like supporting the version that they seem to want for themselves. And I think that that's what Riley, even though sometimes she doesn't understand Jen's choices, um, you know, like, her, you know, her husband, why she married this person or why mm -hmm. she's so intent on this or that without getting any spoilers away. Um, and she, but she still supports it without, without judging it, even though we see a little judgment, but that's the beauty of the perspective, right? Like we see what Riley thinks and feels versus what, what she says, she and says. And we have that, right? Yeah. Like we all have opinions about our friends' lives that we don't voice. We never say out loud. Yeah. <laughs> well, I actually think with both women, they really admire certain things about the other one. And so that's why it's not like, I don't think Riley ever thought, oh, I have to bring Jen along with me. She's like, no, Jen is like so her own self and mm -hmm. she is a free spirit in a way that I will never be. And they're also both a little jealous of the things that are totally different about them, which I think is another thing that happens in female friendship a lot. So she's like, Jen doesn't need me for that. She's the one that has always been the life of the party. She's the one that made our friends. Like Jen is going to be fine. But then, and but she doesn't see that like Jen isn't going to be fine because she has no family support. Like she knows it. But she doesn't feel it because Jen really puts it on. And the same with Jen for Riley. She doesn't see any of the racial trauma because she's just like, Riley's the prettiest, smartest, most successful person I know. How could she possibly have trauma? Which is why she never brings up race. And so I think the blinders we put on for our friends and the things we love about them, 
especially for a longtime friend, are just very different, especially for women. And they are both. And I think this is a, a thing too in friendship and, and marriage. You hear a lot this idea of you got to read your partner's mind. You know, I mean, I think right. big on it. like, don't you know me well enough that I don't have to voice anything and you will peer deep in my soul and know exactly how I feel in any given moment. And we put those expectations on people and our characters do in this book. And that's, you know, not fair. You know, that never works out well when you don't say what you want or need and assume the other person mm -hmm. will know that. But we also put those expectations on everyone. And I think yes. that's a good window into like how Christine and I worked in the very beginning. I mean, even just the writing process, like I would write something and then Christine would go in and like, you know, I would expect her to just like tweak a couple things and she would erase the entire thing and then rewrite the whole thing. And I'm like, why doesn't she know how important that was to me or how well written I thought that was? Because I didn't freaking tell her. But I had expected her from the very start to read my mind. I think we just, our expectations are that other people just know. And so one thing we had to learn was that we had to say out loud at every step of this book, whether it was how you want to write, when you want to write, how we talk about race, we had to be very, very vocal and blunt and honest or this wasn't going to work. Absolutely. Yeah, what was, I mean, not to be like, this is sponsored by Google Docs, but I'm really curious, like, <laughs> what was there? It might as well be our whole tour. It, our, I mean, our whole, I mean, that's our TED Talk, sponsored yeah. by Google Docs. <laughs> what was your process writing-wise in terms of, and Christine, I feel like you're such a master of, like, plot in the way that other editors and writers aren't necessarily in terms of just, like, thinking about the arc of something and like building in like the tension. Like I feel like all of the books you've worked on and that's something that I learned a lot from you is just like making the plot really like sing and push like a story along. So how did you guys think about the plot and then how did like, yeah, logistically like get into the writing of it? And I think it really did help. I mean, thank you for saying that Kiki, but I do think it helped to edit a million books over the years because I can really see how a book should lay out ahead of time and so joe and i were able to start from a really detailed outline like we knew the mechanics of the structure and you can kind of into it like when things should happen and how to affect the pacing and when reveals should happen and things like that so once we had that all the way out especially the book is told back and forth between two characters uh in a like that had to be balanced so they both got 50 percent of the story so that was something that we had to figure out the mechanics of um and so once we had all that down it was almost a blueprint and so then we were in a google doc well first we were in a word doc and then Joe well, christine wanted to be in a word doc the whole time she would have traded back and forth like a thousand word documents with like we are not like that version three two one <laughs> That's Sorry. really publishing of you because I feel like I didn't use a Google Doc until I worked at Goop. Like I was like, no, no Google Doc. Like they won't use it. It's the one industry that is still like it's true. What? It's true. <gasps> true. We what? we we had a lot of publishing people come to our McNally Jackson event in New York, and this came up, and all the publishing people are like, "Word!" <laughs> and I'm like, "See, it's just it's like what we know." But then everyone it's actually, it's other actually, more advanced. Yeah. Industry. <laughs> my vocalization against word has gotten so bad that one of the like really top people at microsoft has messaged me and been like you know what? Really word <laughs> is very collaborative joe why don't you give it a try I'm like mm, too little well, too late my friends at least for seeing these word docs some people i work for it was printouts only so we <laughs> it's like, it's, who shall remain nameless <laughs> it's that um i feel like there's also too all these memes about that's like it's like xyz trauma like how about working with like microsoft office docs like it's just like yes is there such a it's, they get poked fun of a lot but we the, a word document i mean i ended up or a google doc I ended up being a complete convert because it really did allow joe and joe and i in terms of our process to work at the same time in a dynamic document. And that's what we really needed for our style because we didn't live in the same place. We were not even on the same coast or time zone when we were working on this. Um, and we both, I was still working full time at Simon & Schuster with a demanding day job and Joe has a million projects going on all the time. And so this was like nights, weekends, whenever we could fit it in as we were beginning the book, we could just go in the Google doc 
make changes and track changes and leave comments for each other. That was kind of just an ongoing conversation that we didn't have to have face to face at the same time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah, I well, we, we also developed kind of a shorthand to talk to each other in comments in mm-hmm. Google Doc. And it allowed, I mean, it does have like really great things where you're in suggestion mode. And then I could be like, how do you feel about this one word change? Because eventually we got very sensitive to each other's things, mm-hmm. the same way that you do in a marriage. So I'm like, I can tell that Christine will be upset if I touch this one thing. And I'm going to leave a comment and be like, I know that. But we think at this point that we could write a whole book about communication for married couples and keep a lot of people from getting divorced. I would read that. Um, and I forgot to mention, if anyone wants to ask a question, you can just hit the ask a question button and drop it in the chat and we'll get to it, get to it towards the end. Um, and I think it's interesting, too, that you guys both wrote all of the characters. So you both wrote Jen and Riley. And I'm assuming, did you guys both write the prologue and then the epilogue as well or yeah we wrote it all together you know i was thinking about this today because we've been asked this in every interview and but some interviewers are very some are very blunt some are even more blunt we had one male interviewer who was like so joe you're white you're jen and you're riley right and we're just like Like, that's not how fiction works (laughs) (laughs) what i would be curious about is if we would be asked this same question if the characters weren't white and black Oh, that's a really good question. And I don't and think I so. hadn't thought about that until to, until yeah. today. Um, because I and I, we should ask Greer and Sarah because they co-write too mostly. Yeah, that's a really good idea. If I'm gonna asked, talk to Greer tonight. <laughs> like but I feel like a lot of the co-written because don't you feel like of a lot of co-written stuff is like more kind of like thrillers and it doesn't necessarily yeah. have, like, and it's like, also not two point points of view. Yeah, I, I mm-hmm. I'm I'm thinking back on all Greer Sarah's books. They're all singular points of view. They're all No, they're not. No, they're not, not at all. No, they're very multiple point of view from like the mistress and then the wife and like no, they're very they're, oh, they're anonymous girl, I think was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I read that in galley form so long ago. Yeah. Um so yeah, I would just be I, it's it's just it's interesting to me, but well, because the other question we get asked is like I said, some people aren't as blunt, but so who wrote the white person and who wrote the black person, right? But it does boil down to race, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, totally. But I I mean, I think it was this balance of we both wrote all the characters, but at the same time, we chose to write this book together because we did have different perspectives and experiences. Mm -hmm. So though we wanted the book to be cohesive and we wanted each other to have parts of all of it, there were things that Joe brought to the table that were specific to her experience in the world. Mm -hmm. And there were things that I brought to the table that were specific to my experience. They just weren't so, uh, de- you know, delineated. Like this is just Riley. This is Jen. They're, they're, you know, seamlessly kind of tucked into the whole entire book. But it was because I see and hear things in all white spaces that Christine will never experience, right? And she sees and hears things in all black spaces that I will never experience. And we wanted to be really honest and authentic, and sometimes raw on the page with those things Mm -hmm. um but then there's other parts where it's like we set this book in philly and i'm from philly and i'm like i'm very serious about being from philly and so i like i needed to fillify all these characters right so i'm like oh a girl from philly would never do her all the philly details are all joe because i know very also the journalism stuff too i mean christine went to um uh, school for broadcast journalism, but I've been living as a journalist for 20 years. And so like all of that stuff I would fill in and we just, I, I can honestly say there's not a single sentence in this book that both of us did not touch, including like single words. One of my favorite things that I like to bring up is that we knew which words were our like crutch words that we repeated a lot. And so we had a list of them because we were both so type A and together we did like find, search, um, and what and like changed them like literally together for hours and hours on the phone. That's really funny. Christine, I feel like we used to have that in emails and we'd be like a joke, like see who can use like XYZ word like the most amount of times. Oh, <laughs> um, oh, how did you guys 
because you start from the beginning, you knew that you wanted to examine race and exp and explicit, particularly a black woman and a white woman. But did you know what the plot, like what, what was going to be the main tension point from the beginning? And did you ever debate? Because you started writing this book a long time ago, and not that any of these issues are new, but I think they did, especially with like defund the police. I think that movement wasn't in people's consciousness the way it was when you started the book versus today. And part of that is just like the way publishing goes, but you guys are also very ahead of your times always. Um, but did you ever debate other ways of exploring race and how did you ultimately like, how did that come to you first? No, we knew this was going to be the story in the beginning from the very start. And this, you know, Joe, I was Joe's editor at Simon and Schuster. I think we knew that, um, but maybe people watching me not know. Um, but I was Joe's editor at Simon and Schuster uh, for her amazing novel Charlotte Walsh Likes to Win. And as Kiki knows from witnessing me being an editor, I'm very involved. And so very Joe could not, could not get rid of me. And we were talking all the time, and we had a very close editorial relationship there's a kid. that's why there's two of us um, good night. Oh, good night. Good night. now you've stolen the show charlie good night everybody good night uh, so I was Joe's editor, and we we worked really well together. And then uh, we, I um, commissioned this, or it came to be that I was publishing uh, this tie-in uh, to the television show Younger. You watched Younger, right? Kiki, I'm sure lots yeah. of people on here. There's always Younger fans. It always gets a cheer. Yeah. Um, and so I published this book, Marriage Vacation, that was a tie-in to the show. So it was published in real life by Simon & Schuster and then on the show. And I needed a writer and somebody who could do it quickly and well. And Joe Piazza was the woman for the job. And so we had to turn that book around in like four weeks. And that this was Christmas with Char mm -hmm. Charlotte Walsh. But yeah, we like dove back into a Google Doc um, in over Christmas. This is 2017 to 2018. And, you know, it was just fast and furious and fun. I mean, it was a very intense. It was fun. Yeah, but I, I feel like we yeah. 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 And so when that was finished, uh, we wanted to find a way to work together again. And we couldn't figure out quite what that was. But I'd had this idea, as Kiki knows, I have a million book ideas running through my head at all times. Um, and normally you're not thinking, oh, I'm going to write them because you're an editor. So it, it didn't occur to me until the stars kind of aligned at that moment, that I had this idea that felt urgent and timely, which was from the beginning, an, an interracial friendship upended by a police shooting. And so with that germ of an idea, that's what I went to Joe with. And it felt like, again, like the stars aligning. If we wanted to work together, I had this idea, the timing, you know, it just all kind of came together. So in effect, I proposed to Joe and I said, yeah would you want to write this book with me? And, and I said, yes, I will accept your rose. <laughs> and, you know, I'm honestly, like, after Charlotte Walsh, I didn't know if I wanted to take on another, like, kind of heavy-ish novel. Like, Charlotte was about a woman running for Senate in 2016 in the world. Like it, it was a lot. Like I kind of just wanted to write a book about puppies or something. And then I got chills when Christine told me this idea. And especially because I've been a working journalist my whole life. And I see, I see these headlines and I see how the news cycle treats violence against black men and how it is just like click, 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 and then gone. And so I was like, yes, absolutely. Like we, we have to do this book together. But I will say, we, so we started writing it and then we shopped it to publishers. And there were some publishers, it went to auction, but they were like, do you think this will still be an issue by the time the book comes out? And that was in 2018. And then we turned the book in like a week or two weeks before George Floyd was murdered and the world completely changed. But the world for Christine and I, we had been living in that world as so many black people had been living in that world for so long that it didn't feel as much of a shift as I feel like everyone else had felt although and it was such a long 
twisty, turny road to, you know, from the day I proposed to Joe until uh, our wedding day last week, uh, which is actually what our McNally event felt like since there was so many people and there was an aisle that we walked. We, did wa we walked down the aisle together. And the, my biggest, my biggest regret is that we didn't play like the hold hands and walk yeah. slowly. Mm -hmm. um, but I do feel like this book is coming out at the exact right time. I think it would have been a different read and hopefully valuable, and people would have liked it and all that in 2018 or 2019 or you know whenever the stars align for us to start writing it and finish it. But now it feels really fortuitous that it's out now when people do seem more. Uh, eager, inclined, vulnerable, hungry, you know, to have these kind of conversations and yet still scared and still, you know, it's fraught still. That didn't go away just because people now want to talk about it. And so we feel like our book is a tool for people to be able to talk about these things because it's much easier to say, oh, I felt like this when this character did that or, oh, mm -hmm. that reminded me of the time that this happened to me via with those like a little bit of shield of a book in between you and the other person and your raw experiences right like riley and jen are a little bit of a proxy yeah well, i also feel like fiction just touches people in a different way like there's so much great non-fiction out there and there was a, a giant boom of it in 2020 but fiction just feels easier to digest or to read with a friend or to start a conversation, which is why it was always so important for us that this not just be fiction, but really accessible commercial women's mm -hmm. fiction. Yeah, and I think one, you guys did do an amazing job of, of offering people so many different entry points and so many almost different, like helping people put their defenses down in a way, mm -hmm. like there were turns where I felt like there was a lot of places people enter the story, but. I'm also curious, just like bigger picture, because sometimes I do bristle when people like present fiction. Like, I feel like there was this big movement where people started reading fiction that they might not have read in the past like couple of years. And this idea that you're going to educate yourself by reading fiction by, you know, women of color, by black mm -hmm. authors. Mm -hmm. And this idea that it's like, and I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not necessarily saying, it's, there's anything wrong with that right now. Right, like, right, 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 yeah. We have book clubs, you know, now it's like, is that the role of fiction? And mm -hmm. is it a happy thing if that happens as like a secondary or like, how do you guys kind of like think about that in like a larger way? You know, I, I, oh, I, I actually, I love that you brought this up because so I was in San Francisco while we were writing this book and I was invited to come to a lot of white ladies anti-racist book clubs where it was just all like wealthy white ladies who would pick a book by a black author and then they would invite said black author to come to the event. Most of them did say no because they're like, I don't want to come to your white lady anti-racist book club. But it was a thing for a while. Mm -hmm. And I feel like our book we have a different mission than that. Like our, our goal really has been like, how do we use this book that is about something that is so universal about lifelong friendship, something that I think most women do care about, not to preach at you, not to feel like you're like doing homework, but to like let you immerse yourself in this story and then maybe start thinking about how to have a conversation, but it's not like, we're not driving it at you. Um, every second. And you're not going to pick up this book because this feels important for me to do as a white lady. Um, but more like we're picking this up because it's a good, interesting read. And I want to add, I think, a really important point that we did not write this book for white women. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, I think I do think that there's this kind of expectation or there's this idea that when you're talking about race, particularly in our environment right now, that the goal is to, you know, educate people and that that was our mission. And that was not our mission. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, sure, if there's education that happens more, you know, that's great. We were, we're not against that, but we wanted to tell a good story. And we also, you know, as a black writer coming to this, I wanted to create a character that star, you know, a black woman that stars in commercial fiction of the kind that we do not see often enough and that other black readers can see an experience affirmed or can relate to that character, you know? So 
It's not, it's not, um, I mean, this book is not didactic in that way. And I think it, it is very important to us. And the reason that we wrote together is that we do have two different audiences for this book almost. And that's hard to pull off, right? It made, it made it a lot There harder. are black books and there are white books and we pretend that they're not, but that, that that's what happens in, you know, in the publishing industry. And when you're singularly focused on like who's going to buy this book, it's really easy to to kind of um, classify the audiences, right? And so we didn't want that to happen. And so you know, the most gratifying thing to us is is getting equal feedback and hearing that the book is resonating with black women, and we're doing just as many events with black book clubs, you know, and black um, groups than and white groups. You know what I mean? And that. That was not easy to do, period. Um, and and so it's really that we can look out at our audience and, and see such diversity is really meaningful um, to us. But the interesting thing is our audiences are still often segregated by event. Um, you know, it's yeah. we're doing you know, an event with black book clubs. We're doing yeah. an event with white book clubs. They would never build themselves like that. But that's people do self segregate. And so one of our goals is to try to bring people together to have the discussion together. Because I think that mm -hmm. black women and white women, and we, can, we do just keep saying women, mostly because men don't read fiction written by women. God bless them, they should, but they don't. That's a whole other conversation. Um, they will have, black women and white women will have different perspectives. And we really think it's important for them to hear yeah. each of those perspectives on the book. So we're trying to bring together diverse book clubs, diverse individuals, we're essentially, we've become Tinder for readers, for anyone that DMs us and is like, I would like to read this book with someone that is not like me. We're like, we will hook you up. Mm -hmm. um, because if, if anything, this book tour has showed us just how segregated reading groups are. It's a reality that we never talk about. And so Christine, I think it's very important to say that out loud so that we all and, know. And how many books, I mean, I would really want to go back and look just putting on my nerdy editor publishing hat you know, how many books, if we look at all of the white and black, black book clubs that, you know, we've spoken with or have shown interest mm -hmm. in the book in the last year, how many would, how many books would overlap between the two? Do you know what I mean? Oh, like, that would be so interesting. I mean, that would yeah, be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I bet less than a handful. Do you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. in terms of like a, a critical mass of book clubs picks, mm -hmm. you know how that happens where like yeah, yeah. There's a book that's like a big book club pick, right? But mm -hmm. I think it's, it's just the black book club pick, you know, that's common for black book clubs is definitely different than the white book club pick. And I feel like we are, you know, a crossover opportunity that feels pretty rare. Well, and also not, we're, we're both very big readers and neither of us had seen a really great interracial friendship on the page where one of the characters wasn't secondary, mm -hmm. where one of the characters wasn't the sidekick to the mm -hmm. main character, right? I guess it's usually the sidekick. <laughs> okay. Right. No, exactly. Exactly. Uh, and so we wanted to give both women equal time. And it is so interesting who you side with in the book and when you side with them. And I feel like the emotions do go up and down um, throughout the book. And that's exactly what we wanted to happen. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think something else you guys did a really nice job of in the book is showing how they both struggled with this idea of like who's, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but kind of like whose trauma was more. And they <laughs> had these moments, like I think, where, you know, Jen says something like, or sorry, I think it's Riley that says like, you know, she didn't bring up XYZ because it was like Jen was going in this really hard time and she mm -hmm. felt like mm -hmm. she couldn't handle it. And like just showing how they both, and I think maybe... Riley probably was a little bit more cognizant of it than Jen, mm -hmm. um, but showing how they each had like, it, and with their families, it's like, right, Riley had this like amazing cast of characters. Like Christine, the the grandmother, I don't know, for some reason, I just was like thinking of you when you were writing that character. Like she had these like funny, like little sayings. Like there was something in the beginning where she was like, don't date a guy with like dainty fing nails yeah. or like fingers or something. like. I mean, she was such a fabulous character. Um, but I think, yeah, like you guys were saying in the beginning, they, they each had sort of their trauma. And like, so I think you guys did a nice job of showing how it's like, I think maybe that is something that's a little bit universal, maybe more so to women, but just the idea of constantly being like, 
oh, well, like she's going through a harder time than me. Yeah, so I want to protect her from this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then also women being like, but I'm going through so much too. So it's like, I'm going to protect <laughs> her from my trauma, but like I have so much shit too. Like there's just so much that we don't say out loud. And it's one of the reasons that we chose to have Jen going through the IVF and having Riley help her. So I, we, we just read an early draft and Jen at that time had three children in the very like first notes of the book, which I had completely forgotten mm -hmm. um, and was pregnant again. And I was pregnant while we were, I had just had a baby and then I was pregnant while we were writing it. So I'm like, of course, I'm like, this is all I want to write about. Now that I have a two year old, I'm like, I never want to read about children <laughs> or again. Um, but her struggling to get pregnant and Riley paying for it gave us a way to like have Jen having to ask for help and having Riley have to be like kind of the savior for Jen, which is a totally different thing that we normally see on the page where we see a lot of white saviors on the page. And that was the case for Riley's family too. And that was a very conscious choice, right? Because mm -hmm. the obvious or the, you know, your, all of our unconscious bias and all of the years of pulp culture and Every some movie, of the movies yeah, yeah. Have, have fed to us this idea, you know, of, of the nice white family saving the poor black girl. And in a way, we really subvert that narrative kind of directly. And that was, you know, really intentional, too. And I, I, there was another, like, great metaphor that you guys had where you talked about the money as being like a pebble in the shoe. Like, it was this, this thing that was there and was awkward between them. I think that's another common thing in friendships too, where there's this kind of elephant or this thing that you mm -hmm. give someone with an expectation and that feels like a little bit awkward and, and the way that that kind of like came between them. Or it's just something that in a way it's a parallel that it's, it's a little, it's not the elephant in the room. It's mm -hmm. a little, you know, it's like the, little, like it's like a little, a little room. like I'm trying to think of a small, I think about it like a paper cut. Small animal. Like it hurt, like it's things, you forget it's there, and then it comes back, and you're like, oh, there it is. There's that paper We've cut. We've done animals, pebbles, and now paper cuts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All the metaphors. Well, I will say, so while writing this book, we both, this is why it's nice to have a co-writer, really play to our strengths. Like, I'm a journalist, so I can do, like, action and plot all day long. But Christine is amazing with character development and like adding in the details. I couldn't tell you what anyone is wearing, but I can be like, this is how we get from here to there. And so we really, it's nice. I don't, I don't know if I ever want to write a book alone again, because it's, well, really it's also nice. less lonely. You know, I didn't have yeah. anything to compare it to because I've never written a book before, but the editorial process is so collaborative and you're never alone in it because you're just obviously always working with somebody else even if it's not your book and that is what i love about it and so this felt like an extension of that in a lot of ways so i don't know i don't think it would be as gratifying to me even as much as joe and i you know struggled and there were ups and downs in terms of the relationship it was still ultimately i think more gratifying than being alone and doing something um mm -hmm. and both the writing itself um, but also the this part, right? The talking about it and the traveling and the publication, which I've also not ever done before, uh, but I can't imagine doing it so either. Yeah, and I think, and I don't know if this is part of co-writing, but I think you guys also did a wonderful job of not making either character too virtuous. Like, and I don't know if this was partly because I am a white woman, but it's like, there was times when like Jen, I like was like cringing, you know, I, I was like, Jen. oh, Jen, but not from a place where I would never do that, but maybe more so like, oh my gosh, I found myself. Like, I think Jen even has a moment. I forget someone is like saying something and she's like, oh my God, that the person's like, that's so embarrassing. It might be your sister-in-law or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, her sister-in-law says someone else in the a, a nurse or something says like Oh, in a training, maybe? Yeah. I'm not black or I would never want to be black. And Jen has this moment where she's like, Oh my god, of course, that's like absolutely insane to say in mm -hmm. to a group of people. But then she's also like, Oh, I've thought that. That specific moment what wasn't, but I've had there were other moments throughout the book where I was just like, oh Jen, like like just kind of like bracing myself. And yeah. I thought you guys did a good job of um never giving up on your characters, but also showing these very flawed 
side of them in a way that was very human and, and real. Well, we wanted readers to have a lot to talk about. And I think it's fair game to say, was Jen to this or was Riley to this or, you know, and if we created them to be more caricatures of the issue or what we wanted them to be even, right? If they, if they hew to these expectations that people might have had about who they were based on our even thinking about what our agenda for the book would be then that would be a really boring book, right? And so even if there might be some pushback on, oh my God, Jen does this or Riley does this or, you know, but the pushback is what is intentional, right? Like that's the whole point. Like we, we want people to say, oh, how could you be friends with somebody who could do this? Like, that's a fair mm -hmm. question. Like in a million rom-coms, it's like, how could you stay with him? How could you, you know, like, and there is, that's where the discussion comes in, right? And but it's so also not necessarily fair in our book because the reader is in each woman's head mm -hmm. and sees things behind the scenes that the friends never experienced together. So that you are judging mm -hmm. them in a way that their friend will never necessarily judge mm -hmm. them. But making each character flawed was very important to us, but also making each character someone you could root for. I mean, the good things about Jen, I think, because it would have been very easy, especially we, even though we turned this book in pre George Floyd, we went back into it to make her like this, like woke white woman or this woman that then gets very woke. And we're like, that's not what we want. We don't want this caricature. And, but, and the thing that Riley loves about Jen is she is just like freaking loyal. Oh like she yeah. will punch someone in the face for you. Well, the shaved eyebrow moment. That was so mm -hmm. good. Like mm -hmm. I'm she like, shaved her eyebrow. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and that tells you kind of, and that's what we want. That tells you exactly who she is. You need to know about, know about yes. yeah, Jennifer Murphy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so we wanted each woman to be great and also a little terrible in their own ways. And, we had to find ways to make Riley flawed too. In the beginning, she was very, very perfect. And I was like, no one is gonna love, no one loves a perfect character. Everyone kind of hates Tracy Flick. But we had to find ways to make Riley not perfect that wasn't hewing to racial stereotypes that we typically see, right? So I'm like, how do you make a female character imperfect? Like, do we give her some, like an alcohol problem, a drug addiction? Um, did she have a teenage pregnancy? All things that I've done to white characters in the past, like all of those things were in Charlotte Walsh. But Christine was like, no, like as a like black woman with a black character, I can't put those things on, on Riley because people will look at her as a black woman differently than any white character you create. And that was something, honestly, I had not thought of. It was a moment where I really was like, is this isn't about race. This is about building a character. And it was about race. It was one of our first big, reckonings but riley is not perfect we and at the end of the day her ambition does get the best of her she's lying to her boss she's lying to jen for this story but we made her imperfect in ways that i feel like are unexpected hmm. yeah and i think the other thing too that i was like as i was looking back on passages this morning that i kind of forgot about is just how young they are like there's that you, know, you have another great line that says something like adulthood is a series of like relentless beginnings and it was true for both of them um and i thought i mean i, I thought like riley to me could have been a whole story just her at the newsroom and the way she she looked at candace it was candace right was that the senior reporter i mean that was really interesting, just that in its own, this idea of scarcity. And if there's one black one woman, person, yeah. One person, yeah. Yeah, they be the star in this very, and people say this all the time, like, oh, you know, it's not like, you know, you shouldn't feel that way X, Y, Z, but it was a very concrete example. There was one star and who was that gonna be? And like, she has this moment where Candace, she gets the sense that she's being pushed out and she's like, ooh, I should feel a certain way about that. But it was also, it was a chance for her. So I thought that was another like fascinating dynamic of what she was going through in her career. Um, and you know, that she had to make real choices. It wasn't like, oh no, I'm just gonna support whoever and it'll all work out for me. Like it wasn't mm -hmm. like that for her. Oh. And the <laughs> fact that Candace didn't necessarily want her yeah. to be her successor. She didn't choose her. And Riley was like, 
why aren't you giving me more like black girl magic? And Candace was like, not necessarily here to be her mentor. Yeah. And that we really want to touch on that in terms of like, you know, mentorship and obligations. And, you know, it called to mind something that I, I experienced in publishing a lot, you know, being um, one of the few black editors in publishing for so long. And this idea that I was, um, you know, sort of very, <laughs> I think in some ways resentful when I got quote all the black books like all you know all the, especially when someone when an agent would call me for a book like that was just a sports star do you know what I mean like because they were black and I'm like it's I, like if you know Christine you're not sending you her you are, exactly like why are why are like mm -hmm. I don't want to publish the memoir by the tight end of the Raiders like mm -hmm. no thanks but whatever um really off base but. So I would feel a certain kind of way almost when I would get sort of pigeonholed and get all these books. And yet I would also feel a certain type of way when books would go to my white colleagues, right? <laughs> so you like, can't win. And I think that that's what Riley kind of gets into, into the newsroom like with Candace. Like you, you need allies and you want to have these relationships with other black women. And yet the, the, reality of human nature is you're not going to necessarily connect with every other black woman. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if there's only two of you, like what happens? And so that's, that's what we were trying to tap into in a, in a subtle way. Um, my best friend from college actually texted me. He just finished reading the book and the Candace Riley relationship. He's like, yeah, he's like, you expect all of the black women to get like be friends. He's like the same way that when I came out, you thought I would want to hook up with every All other days of many friends. In the world. <laughs> and I think it's a very American thing that we think like, oh, it's going to be on the individual. Like this one individual is going to lift up that other individual. But it's like it's not necessarily the issue of like what books you were and weren't getting, but the issue that like there was not represent like meaningful yeah. representation like across yeah. the industry. So like. It wasn't anything like thinking that like, oh, this one woman, Candace, is going to change like the system or Riley. It's like it's very we have these individualistic ways of looking at these issues that are very systemic and not to take away like the meaning of like any one person. But I, I think that was something that came through in a way that was like I thought it was very like poignant and relatable. Mm -hmm. So we have some questions from other people. Yeah, some of your questions aren't amazing, but we I have a comment. Well, are, a lot of these are questions we haven't been asked. I know. Yeah. And I love the focus on the friendship, too. Pam said, hooray for this insight. I live in a red Western state, and I've needed both stories because I often feel I'm walking on eggshells in my writing, and I'm sure how to come, come how to overcome this and not sounding so white. Mm -hmm. Pam, That's thank real. you for the comment. It's real. Christine and I have been very honest, maybe even more honest than I was prepared for in these conversations, where I, when we first started talking about race, I was very nervous. I was terrified of saying the wrong thing, of like possibly insulting or like losing my new friend, of sounding stupid. And there was all this anxiety. And Christine took some of that as like, this apathy that I didn't want to talk about it, about it. And so both of us brought these different anxieties and nervousness to the table. But I do think they are very real in the national conversation. I think people are nervous. And even in our interviews, we see people stumble on questions all the time. Interviewers, when they, when they start to ask a question that is particularly about race, sometimes They'll be like, and it's directed to me, and they're white. Yeah, directed to you. Yeah, they're like, oh, no, never mind, never mind. I don't want to like, like, oh, like I'm gonna try to figure out how to break yeah. this. Yeah, and we're like, just say it. we're like, you're not gonna offend us. Just, just say it. And how, and how do you guys react to that? Because in a way, I feel like sometimes we should be nervous, especially as like a white woman. I'm like, there's a reason why. Like, I should feel a, like this idea that we shouldn't be nervous or take care or like. I don't know. And it's not to, you never want to put that on the other person. No, but I think this idea, like these yeah. are very serious yeah. things. And when you're coming at it from a position of privilege or where you've done something wrong in the past or where you might hurt someone, like yeah, this idea that you, like, I think in a way we should feel, or I should feel the weight of that when I'm going to ask a question or. Yes. I think that's a really good point because I think the, the flip side to that is a certain amount of hubris then like, oh, well, I'm an expert on this and, you know, you're like there's 
it's a spectrum and that's also mm -hmm. not something i mean i'd rather people as you said err on the side of caution and care so long as that doesn't necessarily prevent a conversation from happening you know what i mean but i think i there's there's not a sense in and i'm speaking from my own personal perspective perspective as a black woman, there's not a sense for me that there's any um, downside to coming at me with caution and care. Like I, mm -hmm. I, you know, like that's not like, oh, why are you being so cautious about this? Like that's not an issue. Yeah. The issue really is the reactions as conversations happen, then, uh, then that's where the real rubber meets the road, right? Like, are you going to be defensive? Are you going to be dismissive? Are you going to be like, you know, you're overreacting or burst into tears or, you know, whatever these kind of cliche that we kind of satirize these reactions, but are real. That's, that's what is more damaging mm -hmm. than yeah, and I think, uncomfortable to talk about this. Like that's yeah, just. Well, yeah, exactly. So I think coming at it, not from a place of like, I'm so scared and like fragileness so that you have to take care of me, but more like, being the same open, honest, and authentic self you would be talking about a really weird date where, you know, a guy left his, like, where underwear in your bathroom, okay. right? And But, but like, coming to it just being, that happened, it happened to me once. So, I mean, I, we didn't even hook up. He just left his underwear in my bathroom. He just, like, just left it there like a token when he knew that that's the weirder out. part that, that okay no i know exactly no, he, he, he went to the bathroom and then he left and then i went into my bathroom and i'm like it's like he like marked his territory by leaving and then he left commando what's pants back on yeah. weird thing i digress but what i'm trying to say is that we talk to our friends about so many things like i knew everything about all of christine's ex-boyfriends before we talked about race so did kiki <laughs> <laughs> Bringing your authentic self and not saying, I'm so nervous about this, but being like, I want to be open and honest, but like, I might say the wrong thing. And like, can you give me grace here? And can we talk and let me know if I say the wrong thing, but I'm coming from a really good place. Even if like, that sounds weird to say, I think it's important to put that out there because Christine didn't know about my fears and my nervousness going in. And so I think it's like, don't be fragile. Don't be weird. And if you can start there with a really open and honest conversation, you can eventually get to a place where you can be way more comfortable talking yeah. about and that's what we've been doing this for three years. All right. Hey, uh, -la 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 -la. This is sorry. Mile. Like, a little mile in to say, like the um, awesome. Christine, I'm sorry. I came on like right when you were about to comment. What were no, you no, no, it's okay. I, I just want to quick last point, and it's a good wrap up point, is that one thing that Joe and I emphasize along these lines is that these are not one conversation, one and done, you know, like we, you can't just say, okay, we talked for an hour and we got everything out on the table and now we can move on and never talk about this again. This is a process. The conversation has to feel like an open door both ways and that this is going to go on and on and on and, and, and be a muscle that continues not just it's kind of just like like creating the muscle for it right like how do i feel more comfortable how do you feel more comfortable and you have to keep doing it the same way you have to keep doing pilates this is true well i love this book so much i'm so Thank proud you of you both and if anyone's watching who hasn't gotten a copy yet they absolutely should it's just like the best and this cover it's so yeah. stunning. Divine, divine. Yeah. We love this cover so much. The prettiest. So good. Thank you. This was Thank so, you, so, so It was amazing to talk Thank to you. Thank you. Always love talking to you guys. Maggie, anything else? Thank you for having us, Book Soup. We love you. <laughs> we love you. Yeah. Um, that's a wrap on our presentation. Thank you again to our guests and to all of you who tuned in this evening. We greatly appreciate everyone's time and your support of independent bookstores. Please, please, please support our bookstore and our authors and pur purchase a copy of tonight's featured book. Just click on the green purchase button that reads, we are not like them directly below the viewer screen. If you'd like regular updates on our upcoming events, make sure to follow us on Crowdcast and subscribe to our newsletter. Have a great evening. And as always, please stay safe, everyone. Thank can you. I just, can we add our, um, I'm C Pride on IG to get book updates and, and mm -hmm. Joe is at Joe Piazza author. So that's like a good way to keep And that is also how we are pairing readers together. So just slide into our DMs if you want us to pair your book club with a book club that is not like yours. <laughs> Fantastic. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you, Maggie. Thank Bye, you. Guys. Bye guys. Thank you.